Imagine light coming from a distant object. Having travelled for thousands or even millions of years, it enters the Earth's atmosphere and is promptly ruined. The air's moving rapidly, distorting the previously perfect image. Light from a nearby bright star, though, will be distorted in exactly the same way. And so by monitoring that light, we can move a correcting mirror 50 or 100 times a second, getting rid of most of the effects from the atmosphere. Unfortunately, not every object of interest has a convenient bright star sitting right next to it, a problem astronomers have solved by firing lasers out into the night sky. The laser is tuned so that when it hits a thin layer of sodium, which happens to lie above most of the atmosphere, the sodium's excited and it glows. Light from that artificial star is distorted in just the same way as an astronomical object, and so the scientists can use that to monitor the atmosphere and remove its effects. Gemini's mirror is over 8 metres across and only 20 centimetres thick. It's this thinness that allows them to control its shape with an accuracy equivalent to the thickness of one thousandth of a human hair. Although the mirror is made of aluminium, it's coated in an extremely thin layer of silver in order to reflect as much infrared light as possible. Just two ounces, or about 50 grams, is enough to cover the entire mirror. The dome is always kept at nighttime temperatures throughout the day, and I can promise you, it's extremely cold. The instruments cover the entire range from the uh, uh, short wavelength optical, the shortest wavelengths that your eye can see, all the way out into the far infrared where the atmosphere cuts off. And so let's start at the beginning, the shortest wavelengths. Uh, the shortest wavelength instrument is, uh, here is called GMOS, the Gemini Multi-Object Spectrograph. It's actually an imager, a camera, as well as a spectrograph. And you've got some marvelous pictures with GMOS. Well, one of the most uh, amazing uh, examples probably isn't a marvelous picture, apart from the fact that the objects are so faint. And these are these uh, amazing gamma ray bursters, uh, apparently supernovae in distant galaxies of a particular type that, that for a few uh, seconds uh, are emitting as much light as, as uh, the rest of the universe combined. The biggest and, bang since the big one. Yes. They're very, very short-lived. So when one is found, we're put on alert and we observe them as quickly as possible. Uh, because they fade out very rapidly. Let's move on. Let's go into the infrared. Which All right. one's next? The next instrument is the Near Infrared Imager and Spectrograph, known as NERI, and uh, it's been used for a wide range of uh, science. The images that have been taken over the last year or so of Titan, uh, those images have used adaptive optics. Without adaptive optics, Titan from here would just be a blur. But with adaptive optics, we can really see uh, a lot of detail on Titan. Uh, but those images allow us to monitor the uh, weather on Titan because we can see the clouds moving, we can see them forming and, and disappearing. So let's move on to the last instrument which is Michelle and the results that spring to mind for me at least are the dust disks. That's right, uh, in the last few years uh, people have found dust disks around a number of uh, fairly young stars and it's believed that these objects could be forming planets and Michelle has been a prime instrument in use to study the properties of the dust, uh, not only the size of the disk, but the properties of the dust particles themselves. And it's gotten some very interesting data, which some of which indicates that at least in one disk, there was recently a collision between two asteroids, which produced a lot of very, very fine dust grains, much finer than the ones that we normally see around these stars. And that gives you an idea of how much dust is being picked up. To see something produced by two asteroids is quite impressive. At That's the right. Distance of these, yeah, these, stars. these instruments on big sensitive telescopes are amazingly good at detecting very, very minor events in the history of a, of a distant solar system. Well, there's lots more still to come. One last question, though. I've always said Gemini. You say Gemini. Which of us is right? Well, I'm right, of course, because <laughs> I took Latin, and in Latin, you pronounce Gemini, Gemini, just like you pronounce, well, even in English you pronounce bikini, bikini, you don't say bikini. Gemini's dome opening at sunset is an amazing sight. It's designed to allow a smooth flow of wind across the telescope, keeping the air steady and the mirror clean. It's a beautiful night up here on the rather windy ridge in front of Gemini. The moon has just set behind the Keck telescopes and the Southern Cross is rising behind me. Over on the right you can see the whole of Scorpius reaching right down and the centre of our galaxy with all the targets that implies just rising. Hercules is up behind me and the most beautiful sight is Jupiter shining high in the sky there. It's an absolutely wonderful night. It gives you a really good idea of why this is one of the best sights in the world for observing. 
sunrise and with the domes closing all around us and the shadow of the mountain stretching out on the clouds below me it's time for the astronomers to head down for some well-earned rest. Meanwhile let's go over to our last two telescopes the Kex for a decade or so the largest anywhere in the world. The first of the twin telescopes started operating in 1993, the second three years later, and they've been hitting the headlines ever since. They work closely with other observatories, which provide interesting targets to follow up with the more powerful eyes of Keck. This is Keck 2, and to be here in front of it is simply incredible. It's immense, the mirror is 10 metres across, and yet it has this lightweight, slotted appearance, which is designed to reduce the stress on the telescope as it moves around. Instruments have been added ever since the telescope arrived up here. Most of them are on the Naismith platforms behind me, but this silver tube sends the laser for the adaptive optic system out into the night sky. The most distinctive feature, though, is the hexagonal segmented mirror. Each of the 72 mirror segments that make up the two telescopes are brought down here to the mirror barn about once every 18 months. Here, they're coated with a very thin layer of aluminium, which provides the best possible reflecting surface. Combining segments like this produces a large reflecting surface capable of collecting twice as much light as Gemini without putting a large brittle mirror under stress. This collecting area comes in useful for all kinds of projects. Tonight's astronomer is Professor Jeff Marcy in the middle of a week-long observing run hunting for planets. We can go to the next star now, Maddie. Right away. His and targets are too small to be seen directly, so instead he looks for tiny changes due to the influence on the planet on its parent star. As the planet orbits, it pulls on the star, and we see that as a wobble as the star moves first towards us and then away again. The wobble's still too small to be seen directly. The star's moving at only running speed, 10 meters per second or so, and Jeff relies on the Doppler effect. When the star's moving away from us, its light is stretched, and so there's a shift towards longer wavelengths, towards the red in its spectrum. When it's coming towards us, the light is compressed slightly, and we see a tiny shift to the blue. It's this small effect which betrays the presence of a planet. We have found an amazing variety of other planets, in fact a much greater diversity than we ever imagined when we started. We have found planets bigger than our own Jupiter, which is the biggest in our solar system. We've found Saturn-like planets, Neptune-like planets, even one seven and a half Earth masses. And the remarkable thing is that we've found some planets that orbit not in circular orbits, but in elongated orbits, like comets reside in. We never expected such bizarre orbits, and we have found many planets that orbit close into their host stars. So we're finding a zoo of planets, and who knows what other beasts are out there. For our last night in Hawaii, we're leaving the mountaintop behind and joining Jeff down in the Keck control room, 9,000 feet Great. below. We can go to the next star now, Maddie. He remains in touch with the telescope via a video link that benefits from the extra oxygen available down there. All of these computers actually run the spectrometer that is the device that spreads the starlight into all of its wavelengths or colors, and we analyze those colors for the Doppler effect. This screen here monitors the starlight as it comes in, and then the exposure is automatically finished, like a camera shutter closing, literally. And then here's the result. This is actually the final spectrum that we get from the star. All of these horizontal lines that you barely can see represent the light from the star spread out into all of its wavelengths. So it's not as simple as a large window popping up and saying, yes, you found three planets. Right, yeah, collect your money at the <laughs> latest planet station. No, it, it'll actually take a few months to analyze these data to see if there are planets in there. Tonight we're observing the 35 nearest stars in the sky, sun-like stars, hoping to find small rocky planets orbiting very close to those stars with orbital periods of no more than a few weeks or months. Readout complete. Okay, Maddie, we'll start on this one. Why do we assume that all small planets are rocky? The reason is that if a small planet were made of gas, the gravity of the planet couldn't hold on to the gaseous molecules and they would just fly away. So if you take a bag of gas and get rid of the bag, the gas just dissipates. The Earth's lost all its hydrogen, for example. Indeed, the Earth has lost uh, hydrogen and most of the helium, so the Earth is already just on the edge of losing most of its atmosphere. Hopefully it won't. Okay, I'm shooting, let's see, yeah, I'm going to tune this back to 150,000, Maddie. Okay. 
Okay. Let, what, what are you looking for? What makes it a planet? Well, that's a good question. I'll show you a great planet. Okay. One of the greatest planets in planet hunting history. Okay. These are the data for the star HD 187123. A memorable name as ever. A British student at the University of Sussex sent me an email once and it said, Dear Dr. Marcy, I hope you don't mind my making a suggestion, but I think you should observe the star HD 187123. And I thought to myself, the audacity of this British schoolboy telling me what stars I should observe. And I thought, well, why not? Let's go ahead and do it. Sure enough, you see the velocity of the star over the course of time wow. varying dramatically and sinusoidally. We're starting this new exposure. It's repeating over and over and has repeated since 1998. And as a result, we call it Planet Kevin, after <laughs> Kevin Apps, the student at University of Sussex, who suggested we observe this star. Well, let's hope there's many more to come for tonight. I'll <laughs> let you get back to work. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Of course, Keck isn't just a planet hunting machine, it has the whole rest of the universe to play with. Patrick, back to you. Sometimes, as I saw the Kecks, I'm afraid, I'm joined now by Professor Richard Ellis, Director of the Caltech Observatory. Richard, welcome back to the sky at night. Thank you very much, Patrick. What do you think have been the highlights of Keck over the last ten years? Oh, that's a tough one. Ten years at any observatory, a lot of interesting discoveries. My personal favourites would be the, the accelerating universe, the fact that we use supernovae yes, yes. to determine that the universe is not just expanding, but that the expansion is getting faster with time. A completely unexpected result. Nobody really expected to no. find that result. I would say that's probably my favourite. Uh, opening up the distant universe... Of course, traditionally, the challenge of large telescopes to find the earliest objects in the universe. Keck has, I think, made great uh, strides in finding populations of galaxies at very, very early times. And then perhaps gamma-ray bursts, the most energetic objects in the universe, proving that they were indeed outside the Milky Way. I have to go back and remember, many people thought they might even be in the solar system. So uh, I think those would be my top three. But an observatory is a changing place, and so really in order to stay at the frontier, we have to provide new capabilities. And the latest news is we have a laser guide star that enables us to use our adaptive optics system to correct for the turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere. Of course, astronomers need to get used to the idea of adaptive optics. For many years, it's been a, an expert's game. And so with this laser, now we can uh, make corrections anywhere in the sky. And so that's going to mean that ordinary astronomers will be able to uh, correct for the uh, turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere. Not just get sharp pictures, Patrick, but also yes. use spectra. So the first results coming out of the laser guide star are very exciting. Probably the most exciting results are the galactic center. We've known for some time there's a massive black hole in the center of the galaxy. With this laser, of course, we can get much sharper images of the actual individual stars orbiting the black hole. Uh, we can actually get the shapes of each individual orbit, and so we can determine exactly how the black hole is arranged. And, excitingly, we see flares of light in the infrared coming from material that we think is falling into the black hole. This would not have been possible without the sharpness of the corrections made possible by the laser. Another very interesting development is to study distant galaxies and find out whether they're rotating and hence are they becoming early spiral galaxies. Millions of light years away? Millions of light years away. These are very distant galaxies. They're very, very small. And of course, Hubble has shown us uh, that many of them do have spiral forms, but one really would like to study the motions of the stars in these galaxies. You need a big aperture to do that, so you need the combination of adaptive optics uh, and Keck. And then perhaps lastly, close to home, we find that many of the outer objects in the icy wastes of the solar system, the so-called Kuiper Belt yes. objects, have satellites. They have, uh, a large fraction of them seem to have little objects orbiting around them. And this is very important in understanding how these early objects in the solar system formed. Again, you need the um, resolution of the Keck telescope and the laser in order to track uh, these uh, Kuiper Belt objects. And, of course, uh, the great thing about having an orbit of an object is that you can then determine its mass. And so this is a very important step forward in the solar system. These are the first uh, results that are coming out of the laser. And I think we will probably have five or ten years of exciting science to come out of uh, the laser science that is being done at Keck. You know, 
all the way through fairly recent science, we've tried to build bigger and bigger telescopes. Hales cry for more light. Right, right. It's amazing. When you look back over the last century, you know, the 100-inch, the 200-inch, the Keck telescopes, and now the proposed 30-meter telescopes, I just think it's mankind's relentless drive to learn more about the universe. Richard, thank you very much. Great observatories, great telescopes, exciting news. I wonder what lies ahead. Good night. Thank you.